Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation provided to us by Capacity CEO David Carandish. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping notes. Today's web webinar presentation is worth one CPE credit. To be eligible for that CPE credit, you must answer three of the four polling questions during the webinar and have a total viewing time of at least 50 minutes. CPE will be available in seven to 10 business days after the webinar. We are unable to grant CPE credit in cases where technical difficulties preclude eligibility. The CPE program sponsor guidelines prohibit us from cr issuing credit to those not verified by the technology to have satisfied the minimum requirements as stated. And in accordance with the standards for the National Registry of CPE Sponsors, CPE credit will be granted based on a 50 minute hour. And now I'd like to introduce Roseanne Bump, Executive Director of FEI Twin Cities. Welcome, Roseanne. Ooh, good morning. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everyone. As Nancy mentioned, I'm Roseanne Bump, Executive Director for FEI Twin Cities. Welcome to another one of our virtual events. It's great to see all of our members, strategic partners, and guests that are joining us today. While I'm making my announcements, I'd love to see a little chatter in the chat box. Please enter what company you're with or where you're joining us from or anything else you'd like to share. We are excited to host this session with the Capacity team. They will share how AI is helping teams do their best work, the challenges of the technology and how it will be used to transform future business processes. I'd also like to take just a minute too to thank one of our strategic partners, Atomic Data, for their assistance in helping us arrange this session. You may notice this section looks a little bit different than some of our others. One of the many benefits of FEI is the opportunity to connect and network with other professionals in the field. Immediately after this webinar, we'll be doing a brief networking session to help you make connections with others on the call. So for now, you can leave your camera and microphone off. And when the webinar ends, I'll invite everyone to join in the networking. If you're not able to stay after, no problem. Just leave the session as you normally would. So I hope to see all of you there. I wanna share a couple of upcoming events. We have many events lined up through the remainder of the year. These can be viewed at feitwincities.com. And I'll pop that URL into the chat box when I'm done so you can take a look and get signed up for additional events if you like. A couple of items I want to highlight on November 4th, we have a webinar presented by Walters Kluwer on the roadmap for continuous finance modernization. Data driven decision making is imperative for organizations to drive higher productivity and profits. Join us for this session on how to build a program for continuous modernization in the Office of Finance. And on November 11th, we have FEI's Brian Cove, who will share his insights on what the election results will mean for companies in 2021. He'll speak on issues such as tax policy, healthcare, and business regulations. Brian Cove is FEI's Managing Director of Technical Activities and FEI's in-house lobbyist. Lastly, look for our networking events in November, including a Viking Bears tailgating party on November 16th and a Cooking with Crocus Hill event on November 19th. And with that, we're gonna get started. I now have the pleasure of introducing Daniel Wallentine, our moderator for the session. Daniel is the Global Territory Manager for Capacity. Daniel, take it away. Thank you so much, Roseanne, and greetings, everybody. Uh, so with me today, I'm pleased to have David Karandish. David is our founder and CEO of Capacity. And prior to Capacity, uh, David has a background in computer science, He's a serial entrepreneur, has started several companies in his career, and most recently built and ran Answers.com, which is based out of St. Louis and sold that business for $960 million. So David, take it away. Hey, thanks, Daniel. Uh, appreciate everyone taking the time out here. Uh, we'll try to make this nice and both entertaining as well as informative, uh, which are the best, uh, best we can hope for on a Zoom meeting. Uh, I think we're going to start out here with our first question. Uh, we've got a couple questions throughout the session. So the poll should be loading up here. Uh, where is your company currently at in its AI automation journey today? Uh, again, uh, got to do three out of the four of the questions. Uh, it should be popping up on the quick poll. All right. So to kind of kick off, uh, I thought it would be helpful just to give a little background on who Capacity is. Uh, so, uh, I helped co-found the company back in 2000, uh, 2017. Previously, as, as Daniel mentioned, I was part of a company called Answers.com that got acquired by a private equity firm. We are headquartered uh, proudly in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we just got listed as Pepperdine's most fundable companies, ranked number four out of uh, almost 5,000 companies this year. 
And then uh, we're also ranked in the top 25 uh, best startup employers in the United States uh, from Forbes. And when I think about our, our evolution and growth, we started out as a conversational AI chatbot solution. Then we began adding knowledge access and sharing. And now we've kind of moved into this bucket that we call support automation, uh, which we'll talk about as we go throughout the rest of this deck. We are working with uh, some great brands. Uh, you'll see some uh, use cases highlighted for some of these folks as we go on throughout the deck. Uh, but yeah, for, pretty, really excited to just share with you what we're up to and uh, see how we can help your organizations. All right, so starting with what we know, support costs are skyrocketing at our clients. It has never been more expensive to support your team or support your customers. And as the world's changed, remote work has obviously gone up. We're all on Zoom and Google Hangouts and WebEx all day. Uh, we've got less support staff available and yet our customers' expectations are where they were, if not higher. And so we, we fundamentally believe that AI is the only way for companies to scale non-linearly. They asked Kevin Kelly, uh, the co-founder of Wired, what the biggest problem the human race is facing these days. And the thing he mentioned is that uh, underpopulation is going to continue to drive the challenges that we have over the next hundred years. How do we get more bang for our buck with less people in the workforce? And so think of capacity as a new kind of help desk powered by AI that's automating support for both your customers and your employees. So why support automation? Uh, first of all, almost two thirds of organizations are seeing an increase in ticket volume. Uh, so more and more tickets are getting created, which means more and more tasks that, that people have to go chase down. One in three customers will consider leaving your organization after just one bad customer experience. So the, the idea that someone will be loyal uh, to all ends, it's just, it's just no longer there. And then a third of team member time is wasted during the workday just searching for information, uh, trying to find that policy, trying to figure out who should I contact for this particular issue, uh, what's in this regulatory guide or, or uh, you know, agreement or proposal. And so you've got this constellation of more ticket volume, uh, people leaving very quickly, and a lot of wasted time. And it's not just IT and customer support. This applies to HR, applies to legal, sales ops, compliance, marketing, training. Every single department in your organization has some struggle with this kind of FAQ overload. So that leads us to our second question, which is which of these areas are you most focused on? from an automation standpoint, from a uh, just trying to build a better workplace perspective. So that one should be popping up in the quick poll here in just a second. All right. Um, I want to switch gears here for, for a minute and talk about Colette. You think of Colette as our kind of your typical help desk support agent. She's frustrated, she's burnt out. She uses a lot of outdated tools and she answers the same questions over and over again. Our goal of capacity is we wanna turn Colette into that superhero support agent who loves her job because she gets to help people with the tough stuff. She's not uh, jumping through all these hoops, trying to get people answers for simple questions. She's just focused on the tough stuff and people are self-serving into what they need. Now, when we looked at automating the support function of these orgs, we recognized early on that there are a lot of pieces you need to have a well-oiled machine uh, for your support automation. You need a place to store your frequently asked questions. Otherwise, they're going to land right back on Colette's desk. You need the ability to upload and search relevant documents uh, because a lot of the information that she pulls from is in a PDF somewhere. Uh, you want to give her the ability to author content and place it on, uh, on her support website, as well as triage and direct where questions should go, uh, which uh, subject matter expert these things should be sent to. You want to give her the ability to jump directly into a conversation because uh, whether internal or external, uh, th there comes a point where you will need to get a person involved. And then she's got systems that she connects to all the time, like email, CRM, her proprietary apps, and even processes she does over and over again, like setting up an account 
or onboarding a new team member. So we believe that the modern help desk should be a suite that encompasses it all. Your FAQs, cloud drive articles, conversations, live chat, app integrations, developer platform, all in one integrated package. So let's kind of unpack this for a minute. How, how does automation work? Uh, on the left, you could have Connie, the consumer, or Emily, the employee, either way. They send their message into capacity. Capacity comes back instantly with the response. Today, we are answering up to 92% of questions automatically. And the reason we're able to do this is we can pull from all these various sources, your FAQs, your cloud drive, your dev platform, your conversations, as well as because of the investments we've made in our natural language processing. Anything we can't answer gets routed over to a person who can jump in either via live chat, if someone's available right then, or they can do a follow-up ticket. But unlike other ticketing platforms, when that uh, agent responds to that question, we're actually gonna store that answer in the knowledge base for next time. So the AI is constantly learning the ins and outs of the system. Now, in terms of the learning, we can think of it in terms of three components. The first part is our NLP. Uh, the natural language processing ensures you don't have to type in your question just right. Uh, we'll go through that in more detail here in a bit, uh, but we can handle your acronyms and typos and variants. The second part is around our machine learning, uh, where we can automatically extract information out of your documents. Uh, we're going to show an example of that in a few moments as well. And then uh, lastly, the AI itself, the more questions you throw at capacity, the smarter it gets. And so it's just constantly learning the ins and outs of your org. Now we view self-service as the heart of automation. So you got Jackson here, he wants to know what the closing date is for the Simmons loan. You get it's an instant response back directly from the bot. Uh, again, you don't need to worry, worry, worry where you got the information. You just ask your question and get an instant response. Or you could ask a, a more of a uh, uh, external facing question, right? How do I update my billing information? And Capacity will come back with a link. Again, whether you're a customer or a team member, we are deflecting that ticket or that phone call or that email from ever happening. Now, in terms of how does the system work, I thought we drill down just a little bit on what we call our bird's eye view. So you got your user on the left chatting with Capacity. When you send a message to Capacity, that message will go through Capacity's brain, which is a collection of over 40 different neural networks and algorithms that are effectively voting on what did you mean by what you said. Now, if they have a response for what you said, they understood what you said, then we'll go pull information from a knowledge base, which could be your FAQs, your cloud drive, your articles, or we can go into our workflows where we have uh, pre-built workflows within your org or a developer platform that can go kick out to third-party apps like Salesforce, like Ellie Mays and Compass, like Office 365 or NetSuite. Uh, alternatively, if you've got information that lives in your data center that's uh, kind of embedded within databases behind the scenes, our live DB technology can sit in front of your database and allow, allow you to ask natural language queries directly into the data itself. Now, if Capacity doesn't know the answer to the question, uh, we can then send that into the help desk like we mentioned before. Uh, there, the Colettes of the world can either jump in with either a ticket or a live chat. But again, the learning uh, sends it all the way back to the knowledge base for next time. So this is the flow of what's happening behind the scenes with the interaction between the knowledge base, the workflows, the help desk, third-party apps, and your data. We're working with some awesome brands here, uh, both directly in the financial services space, as well as uh, some adjacent spaces. Uh, anything from a US bank and, and an HP enterprise, all the way down to a West Community Credit Union or Airedale Statesville schools. So we can work with a wide variety of different organizations. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Daniel uh, to talk through uh, some of the use cases that we're seeing with some of our clients. Yeah, thanks, David. So just to highlight a few of these groups before we dive into the demo here, uh, Planet Home Lending is a mortgage company based out of Connecticut that came to us during the heart of the pandemic, really look, looking for a way to better support their borrowers uh, throughout the crazy times of forbearance requests, loan modifications in the mortgage industry exploding this past year, uh, as well as better supporting their employee, employees as the business moved to rem a remote structure. 
So in just the first few months, they've seen over 13,000 questions automated via capacity. Another that we've been working with is US Bank. And we did a project with US Bank a little bit over a year ago, looking at their onboarding process and all of the different training materials, documentation and information that a, a new loan officer needs to get ramped up in their role at the bank. What we did is we connected that information to capacity, providing a virtual assistant for loan officers. So instead of going to support teams, trainers, et cetera, and so forth, they had the virtual assistant to assist them with all the commonly asked questions, how to do things, uh, in Salesforce and their other operating systems. David's going to show some examples of that, but a really uh, another great uh, use case example. And their teams projected over 35% reduction in support for new hires. And one other that we'll highlight quick is Newell Brands. So Newell Brands is a very large consumer packaged goods company uh, made up of over 40 co portfolio companies underneath their portfolio and over 50,000 employees. Newell was really looking for a way to better centralize all of their HR shared services support. Having all of those different teams across the various companies was very uh, manual and costly in terms of how they were servicing their employees previously. Uh, so with capacity, we've seen over a 20% reduction in the commonly asked calls cases that go into the HR shared services desks. David, take it away and dive into the demo. Awesome. Uh, give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen here and we will begin. So where I thought we would start out, uh, we've got a, a kind of a sample mortgage company here, Lewis and Clark Mortgage. And you can see here uh, that we've embedded capacity on the website itself. And this is something that you can do both on an intranet or on a uh, customer facing website. So we've got our capacity bot here. Uh, they decided to name their bot Max. Uh, all of this is customizable. The branding, the colors, the look and feel can all uh, match whatever guides you like. So I can go to capacity and say hi, and I'll come back and say hello. Or I can go to capacity and say something like, oh, let's see, my password needs to be reset. And you'll notice here as I'm typing, we can, uh, we can actually do autocomplete. So we can direct you toward the questions that Capacity knows how to answer. Now, not only can it do kind of question and answer out, but we can do multiple choice. I'm gonna go in and select, uh, I need uh, to reset my Encompass password and it's gonna go in now link me back to uh, the page to go put in my email and do the reset. Again, just simple, straightforward, frictionless. Uh, another example, is we can plug into platforms like Ellie Mays and Compass. So I could say something like show, uh, show the Johnson loan. And you'll notice here, it'll log into that uh, third party system, pull back the borrower information, the loan info, everything that I need. True story, we've had uh, loan officers out on the golf course who needed to get information for one of their clients they're golfing with, normally would have had to drive back to the office, go pull this information out of some desktop app. Instead, they were able to pick up their phone, ask capacity a question, come back instantly with the response. And again, the, the basic idea here is we just wanna make it as simple and frictionless as possible to find what you need. Now, a couple of implementations that we're doing uh, for customers, I'll start out with one here for West Community Credit Union. Uh, West Community Credit Union, you can pull this up on their website. Uh, if you are a, a client of West Community Credit Union, you could ask a question like, oh, I want to know about the routing number. And again, as you type it, we'll do the autocomplete. It matches their branding look and feel. From the time that we implemented at West Community Credit Union, their assets under management are up roughly 2x. We've gotten their calls into their call center to go down by 25%. And their net promoter scores are up by a full 10 points. So bigger business, less support uh, costs, and higher SAT from their customers. So it's kind of a win-win-win there. Uh, another example here that I want to show is at uh, Home Fundit. So this is a, a brand of CMG, uh, CMG Financial. You can see here. They've uh, kind of named their bot Peyton after their, uh, their French bulldog. Uh, again, as I start typing, 
It'll match to a wide variety of questions. You know, what are non-conditional gifts? Again, goes into the guides, comes back instantly with a response. You'll notice here, every, every question we have has a thumbs up, thumbs down. Whenever I thumb that question up, we're actually teaching capacity to match to that a little more often. Every time we thumb it down, we're actually going into the ML algos and we're saying, hey, that was not a good match. Let's go improve that for next time. Next one I wanna show uh, what we're doing at Planet Home Lending. Again, similar, uh, similar idea. We want it to match their look and feel, their branding. You'll notice here that they went as Stella. Uh, they even customized the avatar. The designers there got a little cute and made the uh, the X button was actually her necklace. I thought that was that was pretty cool. I'm always geeking out over cool design stuff. But again, uh, basic idea. You know, how can I do automatic payments? I ask my question. I get a response back. Now, not only can capacity be uh, designed for let's call it external use that you can put on your your, your customer facing website, you can also pull capacity in to whatever apps uh, you use. And so I'm gonna show an example here um, using uh, Slack as our instant messenger platform. So let me pull this over from the other screen just a second here. Okay, so here we go. So I can ask Capacity a question uh, on Slack, just like I was chatting with anyone else in the organization. So I just asked about the weather, came back with the, the answer here. Uh, so I, I, true story, this happened the other day. I just got a new uh, phone and I was trying to get on the VPN and big hassle. So I went to Capacity and I said, how do I connect to the VPN? And it went into our knowledge base went and did a big search, came back to me instantly with a response. Now, I actually need to get this VPN info over to Jeremy on my team because he just got a new iPhone as well and he was running into the same problem. So I can go to Capacity and I could say forward that to Jeremy. And now Capacity is smart enough to know that the, what the last question was that I asked, to know that Jeremy maps to Jeremy Burroughs on my team. I actually went out and wrote Jeremy a little email with all that info. Again, it's just simple, it's straightforward, it's frictionless. And now in fact, not only can we retrieve information from these systems, not only can we forward info, we can actually have capacity to go take actions on my behalf as well. So I want to schedule 15 minutes to meet with Cindy and Chris. And now capacity will look at my calendar, it'll look at Cindy's calendar, it'll look at Chris's calendar, smart enough to know that we've got multiple Chris's in the org. So it can disambiguate for me. And now it's gonna go in and find the first five times and all of us can meet based on our time zones, our meeting availability windows, our preferences. I'll say, let's meet tomorrow at 9.30. And the next thing you know, capacity is gonna go in and update my, uh, either my Google calendar or my Outlook calendar. And just so you all know, uh, this is actually working. I'll have it pop it open here. I'm going to go ahead and delete the invite because poor Cindy and Chris are the victims of my calendar scheduling demos and they get mad when I leave these fake invites on there, but such is the occupational hazard of working at capacity. All right, so we've shown capacity external, we've shown capacity internal, we've shown capacity pulling knowledge, doing some apps. How do we administer capacity? What does that look like? Uh, so let's walk through some examples here. So this is the capacity console. You could think of the capacity console as the central hub of where uh, backend administration for capacities knowledge occurs. It's broken up into a couple different sections. We've got the knowledge base, our help desk, our uh, document mining, our apps, our developer platform, workflows, and analytics and settings. So we're in the uh, knowledge base section right now uh, I'm going to go, who am I going to pick on today? Let's pick on finance and admin. And we'll, uh, I guess we'll pick on human resources. So if I go look at our facilities dialog, we can see all the questions related to that topic. I can go click on a question 
And now we'll see all the variants of the question and we'll see the response. Uh, anyone can go in, anyone who has access can go in and edit this response. So it's designed to be as easy as editing a Microsoft Word document. And in fact, uh, you can even set an expiration date for your responses because not all information is going to be evergreen within your org, either internally or externally. Now, as we were going along, when we started, we had these questions, uh, questions and answers we put into the knowledge base, but a lot of our clients had documents that they wanted us to search or the information was buried in a document somewhere. And we, we actually came up with three different types of documents uh, that we'll address today. The first is the completely unstructured document. It's where you have one document of that type. You don't see a lot of them, uh, but, but it just happens to be you have that one, one copy of that doc. In that case, you can go to capacity and you can start to search. But as you search here, in addition to the, uh, in addition to the Q and A that we talked about earlier, we can actually link into the specific page of the document that we're looking for that answers that question. So I was looking for the parental leave policy. It took me right to page 34 of the kind of employee handbook overview. It gave me the exact policy I was looking for. Again, no searching, no going through and doing, looking at 12 different docs to get there. I just asked my question got an answer back in a simple natural language form. Now, the next place, uh, the next place that we see people turn is this thing that we, we like to call our live DB. And the reason that we, I, I showed this earlier on the, the bird's eye view, but the basic idea around live DB is that we want you to be able to uh, leave your data in your own proprietary database so we don't need to see all the, the nuances and the ins and outs, but if you wanna expose that data back up to capacity, you can now write queries in your database and create a little API that can then be dropped directly into the, uh, the, the capacity bot. Uh, so this works really well with highly structured documents like databases. Now there's a third category of what we call semi-structured documents. We're gonna cover that in just a minute. Uh, but the basic idea here is that we, we want to show uh, that whatever your document type is, we want to be able to query that data and make it, make it accessible. Now, we mentioned earlier this idea of questions in, answers out. There are also going to be times in which you've got um, a question that doesn't have a simple answer, it needs to take you through more of a guided conversation. And so with this, we came up with this platform uh, that we call our guided conversations platform, conveniently named. And the basic idea is I can take a question like, what educational benefits do we provide? And instead of just giving you an answer over here on the right, we're going to give you a guided conversation that you could choose from. And so uh, using this as a, just a demo example, uh, if somebody selected that they were an intern, eh, sorry interns, we don't have tuition reimbursement, but if they selected that they're full-time, then we could actually take you through a step-by-step -step pathing tree around uh, whether you're trying to get reimbursement for conference or for tuition, et cetera. Each guided conversation is made up of these cards. Cards can collect info, go through multiple paths, send out messages, email, uh, do help desk tickets, start a workflow, we'll come back to that in a minute, route inquiries, do live chats, it, it's really, you can think of it almost like a, like a miniature survey builder, except the survey builder, instead of being done in a kind of crusty old form, you can deploy it in a uh, modern sleek chatbot interface. Okay, so we got to this point where we had lots of clients using capacity, asking questions, getting answers, doing uh, app integrations, pulling information out of uh, knowledge bases, documents, but they came to us and said, David, we got this problem where we want to take a process that we have, like say uh, onboarding a new team member or uh, taking someone through the, the loan process. Uh, and these things just, you're just not gonna get done in a single session. We need the ability for capacity to help us automate the steps along the way. So we, we built this uh, part of the product we call workflows, which I'm gonna demo for you right now. And the basic idea around workflows is we're gonna take an offline process, digitize that process, 
and then assign steps of that process directly to the capacity bot. So here's a uh, community bank with three workflows. They've got an employee onboarding workflow, a loan creation workflow, and a loan origination workflow. I can go click on loan origination, and now we can see all of the steps of that workflow itself. Going through credit bureaus, approvals, doc verification, et cetera. All these steps can have Boolean logic, uh, what, whatever you need in order to uh, direct where someone should be in the, the flow itself. If I go over to my toolbox on the left, I can go add a workflow within a workflow. So in this case, I'm going to add the uh, loan creation step, and we're going to embed that within my loan origination workflow itself. And the beauty of this is, is it's kind of like Inception, where you can go one level in the dream, and the next level, and the next level. You, you might have a team that manages a sub uh, workflow. They don't necessarily need to manage the outer workflow, uh, but you want to embed that in that broader process. And we can make that happen here. Now I'm going to add a new task. In this case, um, we want to send the closing disclosure at the end of the loan. And I'll give it a name. I'll give it a description. We'll go ahead and assign it to Isabel on my team. We'll go hit create. And now if we go up to the top of the workflow, we can turn this on. I'll go back to my main screen here. Come back a little later and we can see that Amy Anderson has applied for a loan. She's about three quarters of the way through the process. And now if I go uh, click on that particular instance, we can see all of the uh, all of the stages that have been completed so far. Now this is this is great so you can you have a great visual view into what's been done. But what we learn when working with our clients is a lot of our clients really don't know how long each step is actually taking with their processes. So I can click on this particular task. We'll say that this task has been in progress for 15 minutes, but on average, it's taken an hour to complete across all the other instances of this workflow. And it's taken three days from the beginning of the workflow to get here. So if you wanna know what are my bottlenecks, what are my holdups, what's keeping my work from flowing, we can help you identify that. Now, if we click on view ticket details, we can show you all of the uh, tickets assigned to Isabel. We have these embedded actions that can be placed in here. So she can go select send closing disclosure. It'll flip this ticket over to resolved. And now if we go back to our workflow, we can be on our merry way. Now that works really well for simple tasks. Uh, maybe something that Isabel is going to do once or twice. But if she's doing this tens of times, hundreds of times, thousands of times a week. You don't wanna assign it to her or even her faster coworker. What you really wanna do is reassign this task back to capacity. So what we're gonna do is turn this into a capacity embedded action. In this case, uh, this is gonna be a send an email. Now we can populate that email with information we collected earlier on in the flow, like the email address, like the full name, like the document we wanna attach. And then when we go hit create, Instead of that task being assigned to Isabel, it's now assigned to capacity and it's linked directly to our Gmail integration. Now fast forward a couple steps and stages. We think we've got an opportunity to automate as much as 70% of your workflows by assigning those tasks directly to capacity. Now, the last thing I wanna end with is uh, our most current uh, project, the, the newest extension to the capacity suite. And this is, uh, I wanna go, go back and revisit that concept we talked about earlier around these semi-structured documents. So uh, to start off, kick out of the browser here. And we're going to talk about my friend, Bob. So here's Bob. Uh, Bob has a, an escrow uh, review statement. Uh, and in that res escrow review statement, it turns out he's got a shortage just under 500 bucks that he owes on his escrow account. So this is an example of the ty a type of document that a uh, mortgage call center might be dealing with. They might've gotten this by mail. It might've been electronically emailed to them. Uh, I wanna point out this is, this is an image. So there, I can't select the text in here. Uh, and we've designed it in a way where uh, you can effectively go in and you know, this is just another PDF that you'd find throughout the org. Now, if you look at it though closely, while it's not a database per se, there are a lot of fields that we'd wanna be able to ask questions on and we wanna be able to query from. The statement date, the loan number, the property address, the mailing address, 
the escrow shortage. These are all examples of things that we ideally like to have a system that could read rather than have a human have to go manually on a stair and compare and enter this data into another system. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna go into uh, my, what we call ML docs workflow. And let's just go full screen here. Uh, I'm gonna kick off this flow first and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk through it a little bit. Um, let's say yes to mine. Uh, the basic idea here is that we've got our broadcast node that's going to tell me, that, hey, we want to launch your workflow itself. Then we're going to go through and do some logic and say, should we mine this document or not? Then when we go into mining the document, open that up, we will go into Bob Sims's uh, file that we selected. We have a template associated with the escrow statement. So we know uh, this is the type of document that we're, we're wanting to mine. And now uh, if we go into the instance view, I'll show what the output looks like. And this particular one's still in progress, but I'll show one that we, we ran from earlier. So uh, in this case, uh, the mining process allows us to actually pull the data out of the document using OCR and some AI algorithms around document mining. So we can pull Bob and his address and his uh, letter date and his loan number all directly from that document and then go submit it into Salesforce or his uh, system of record down the road. So just to recap, uh, we have built out capacity in a way where we wanna answer, again, 90% plus of your questions. Anything we can't answer from our AI powered knowledge base, we'll go kick over to the help desk. Help desk is easy, simple. It's there for anything that falls through the cracks. But when it goes to the help desk, we store that information in the knowledge base for next time. On the workflow side, we've got our app integrations. So we're connecting to over 50 different uh, products out of the box and we've extended it out so you can add your own integrations as well. On top of workflows, you can build out a low code, no code environment that walks you through the different steps of a process. Those steps can be automated by assigning them to the bot. And then if they, are, they still require human input, again, they, become, they can become tasks in the help desk itself. So we're automating your questions, we're automating your tasks with a human in the loop in the middle. That's what we're here to do at Capacity and that's how we see the entire financial services sector being changed for the better. So uh, I think we are up for one more question. And that question is, what will you do next? Seeing this, uh, seeing this info, seeing what's possible in terms of automation, what's the next step from a, um, from a personal standpoint for your organization? So I think we have a few questions coming in. Uh, Daniel, do you wanna, were there any questions you wanted to start with? Otherwise I can, I can start pulling some from the chat. Yeah, so I got one um, for Roseanne that we want to touch on. Um, and that is, you know, more broadly speaking, what does the future of AI look like? What are the challenges and lear learning experiences we've seen from our clients? Um, and yeah, just have some open dialogue around that. Yeah, so the, the way I like to think about it is that most companies try to pit humans against AI. And it's like, oh, we're going to have an entirely human-centric experience. We're going to have an entirely AI-centric experience. And we fundamentally believe that the two need to work hand in hand. Uh, an AI level zero support system should be able to hand, handle 90% plus of your questions, but it should gracefully hand off back to, the, uh, back to your support team, your level one team, where needed. And so uh, I was on a website the other day. I had a question. It was, you know, I don't know, 1030 at night. I didn't really want to talk with the person, but I wanted to get my question answered. Conversely, if you have a question that it's more private or sensitive in nature, you want to be able to kick over to, you know, a live chat experience or a, uh, or a traditional level, level one support follow-up. Uh, 
I had another question here. Uh, I think this was from Tom. Uh, my one concern is that AI and auto answering questions doesn't always properly address excellent customer centric responses. And the customer gets stuck in an auto response vortex that turns the customer off. Uh, cost savings is done at the risk of a loss of customer. How is this trade-off viewed by companies? Let me give you a great example of this. Uh, my, uh, we started doing work from home, obviously pandemic, craziness, and we decided to get some of the new iPads. This was, uh, this was back in, uh, I guess back in March. So uh, I ordered the new iPad, realized we we're gonna get the keyboard with it. Keyboard didn't ship. I go to UPS's website and I'm talking with one of these Vortex bots that you mentioned here. I asked one question, it had the answer to the question, it was great. I asked my second question, three problems occurred. First problem was, it didn't know the answer. Okay, that happens. I, I, I'm very familiar with bots, so I, I understand that. Second part though, and this is important, the bot didn't know that it didn't know the answer. So there was no feedback mechanism for it to indicate that, hey, I, this, is, this is not going well, right? Uh, I, I have lots of feedback indicators from having a conversation with my wife and the conversation's not going well. Her visual, her tone, her responses. Like I, I, I have a good sense when something's not going well. Uh, but this bot did not have, uh, did not have that, that feedback. And then lastly, not only did it not know that it didn't answer my question, couldn't answer my question, didn't know it wasn't answering my question, there was no escalation path, right? So there was nowhere to go uh, from that experience. And so you're exactly right. Those type of bots are terrible. And we think most bots, frankly, are terrible. Uh, that's why we've specifically focused in on addressing those three areas. The first is with capacity, you're going to have uh, industry leading natural language processing that's constantly improving. Uh, so you're going to get the right answer to your question the vast majority of the time. The second thing is, is that with our feedback mechanisms, simple as they may be to start, uh, we will know if somebody is having a good experience or bad experience. We can look at sentiment. We can look at these types of factors behind the scenes. And then third, every single question you ask can be escalated up to a person. And so don't view this as uh, good experience, bad experience. View it as levels of escalation along the way. Uh, I got another one here from, it uh, looks like from George. Can you talk about use cases for professional service firms? Great question. So when I think about professional services firms, I think a couple of pieces of our suite are very applicable. One, uh, workflows. Every professional services firm is in the business of uh, going in to a, to a client and helping them achieve some kind of goal, which often involves a process. And so the fact that you can use our workflows platform to map out a process and just be a digital representation of it, but also to assign tasks to that process to the bot itself, uh, it's a great way for you, for you all to get started. A uh, second one is just deploying chat and digital transformation. So a lot of companies are going through how do we improve our employee experience, how to improve our customer experience, bringing capacity into those uh, into those line, you know, lines of fire, frankly, to help reduce the emails, tickets, phone calls happening. It's another great use case uh, that we've seen professional services firms work through. Uh, next one, does Capacity have a Microsoft Teams? This is from Ryan. Does Capacity have a Microsoft Teams integration? The answer to that is yes. We can plug into Slack, Skype, uh, Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, uh, Symphony, Ring Central, and I'm sure I'm missing one other, right? All the major chat platforms we have an integration with. Uh, another one here, let's see, how do you handle incorrect data? Can a user correct it or is more involved? So a couple of things uh, to start. First, uh, every single response has that thumbs up, thumbs down. So we're always collecting feedback. The second thing is, is that we can turn on source citations so that not only do you see the response, but you can see where that response was, was sourced from. Most of the time in our experience, people aren't getting the wrong answer to the right question. People ask a question ambiguously to a bot, the bot wasn't quite sure what they meant, and then they give them the right answer to the wrong question. 
So we don't want that to happen. We can actually source the citation of where we got the response from. The other thing that we do is we do, uh, and I didn't show this in the demo today just for time, but this concept called a clarifier. So when we ask capacity a question, and capacity thinks about, doesn't know the answer. If that score, that natural language processing score is above a certain threshold, we will match and go pull from the knowledge base or an app or document. If it's below a certain threshold, we'll kick over to that help desk and go create that ticket. But if it's in between, we can actually go back to the user and say, did you mean A, B, or C? And if you select B, not only will that help the user figure out what they're looking for, but we can also remember that selection down the road. Uh, lastly, uh, you can set whatever permissions you want in terms of the, uh, the backend Copilot interface uh, for the capacity console or who you wanna give access to editing those, those questions. Uh, okay, so next one here, is the technology good for any size company or does it make sense only for larger companies? Great question, Roseanne. Uh, internally, capacity is taking on the work of a team member. And so the bigger the company, the more work there is to take on. What we've found is that internally, capacity tends to work on uh, companies of you know, a couple hundred employees and up. Externally, capacity is answering customer-centric questions, uh, you know, helping to, you know, get more conversions on your website, drive you more toward uh, calls to action. Capacity can scale down to the smallest business out there. Anyone who has a website could use capacity. So typically our larger companies go internal, our smaller companies go external, but about, I think between 25% and 30% of our clients are actually using a hybrid of the two where they're using capacity both for internal and external purposes. Uh, next one here uh, from Dennis, what is the effort to establish capacity into a firm? For example, a mechanical engineering firm has thousands of designs and a large database of SolidWorks. Thought is uh, we wanna search this data to be able to utilize previous design data to create a new design. So the first thing we, we would do uh, whenever we're looking at an application specific integration is we would, we would first say, does that data source have an API, an application programming interface where we can talk to that system? If the answer is yes, then we can go scope out that integration. We can typically do integrations from anywhere from call it three weeks to 60 days, depending on the complexity of the integration itself. If that information is sitting in a database and it doesn't have an API, uh, but that database is in one of the common formats like Oracle or MySQL or MariaDB or Microsoft SQL, uh, then we can actually go in and hit the database directly with those queries. So typically we, any knowledge centric use case we can get up and running within 30 days and then add on top of that, whatever that app integration time looks like. Yeah, so real quick, David, just to chime in on that, you know, contrary to the typical software as a service implementation where it's a big one-time setup and launch, you know, we really focus on what are the most immediate addressable use cases, launch there in 30 to 60 days, and then have subsequent phases where we're plugging additional things into the background uh, and relaunching uh, just a broader knowledge set to the user base. Awesome. Uh, I'm trying to see if there are any more que any more questions coming in. Coming in hot. Coming in hot. David, this is Roseanne. I can ask a question while um, some folks type in some questions if they like. But how did your company get started? What's it look like now with COVID? Have you had any changes that you've needed to make? Tell us a little bit about the business and how you got it started and some of the challenges. Yeah, so we, we started Capacity in... January of 2017, we actually started it here in my home office, and now we're all back to the home office, so things are kind of come full, full circle. Um, and I, originally, we built a little prototype around doing some internal tasks and scheduling and HR type, type functions. And as we started meeting with more and more companies, we realized that uh, there was an opportunity here to automate any area of support that you have within an org, whether it's customer support, IT support, HR support, sales support, et cetera. We raised uh, about 36 million to date uh, from a wide variety of kind of angel, uh, angel investors, angel groups, 
a lot of folks in the YPO, Young Presence Organization Network, uh, are both clients and investors. We're actually wrapping up our Series C round right now, uh, which has been very exciting. And uh, yeah, through that through that process, uh, we, we started building out the bot first, then we added the help desk, and now we're building out the, the whole workflows component. And what we've seen is that the company has blossomed as uh, we're taking on more and more of the complexity of automating support. I would say there are a lot of companies out there that can give you a chat bot. I think we do a pretty darn good job with it and I would put us up against anyone, mm -hmm. but it's the integration of the pieces together, which frankly took a lot of engineering resources to build and, and took a lot of time. Uh, but we're now, you know, we're up three X year over year from a business standpoint, top line, uh, while we're all working from home, we've been uh, just killing it this year in terms of growing new customers and seeing this thing, uh, start to hit its stride. That's great. That's a, that's a relatively new company, 2017. You're just getting started. We're just getting started. Actually, I just had a question come in here from Dennis. Uh, is this software that we add to our network? Is it a subscription-based service? So the whole thing is a software as a service play. Uh, pricing will scale depending on which parts of, this, of the system you need. So if you just need a knowledge base and a chat bot, it can come in at a pretty entry-level price. If you need advanced workflows, we can scale up from there. Everything lives in our cloud-based uh, environment. We are SOC 2 compliant. We're happy to supply our SOC 2 audit as needed. Uh, the one exception that we run on-premise is our live DB uh, instance, which effectively lets us talk to your database without you having to upload your database into our system. Any more questions? Okay, we got another one in here. Uh, what do you see as the constraints that are currently limiting your growth? So believe it or not, um, when we started, we, we actually started doing a lot of in-person events. And our in-person events, after looking at the data, you could bifurcate the results of those events into two categories. There were categories where we uh, had a table, maybe we had a booth somewhere, but we didn't really get a chance to demo the product. And there are categories where we got up on stage and we got to show an audience kind of like what we're doing here, the product in action. And we got such an overwhelming response by the demo and that the actual like seeing, like seeing is believing here, that we realized that uh, we are going to do is we're going to do well in acquiring new customers when we have an opportunity to demonstrate the product. So as uh, obviously the pandemic has hit, people's uh, receptivity toward webinars has gone way up. I don't know if it's receptivity or if it's the only option they have or, or both. Uh, and so we are now trying to get as many of these types of webinars out to showcase the product and say, look, uh, we would love to have an introductory conversation and see if we can be helpful. And if we're not helpful, like we can't be helpful. We're not, we don't really don't want to waste anyone's time. Uh, but we, we believe this product really shows itself well. And so we've been adapting a lot of our marketing uh, to showcase the product, show what we do rather than just, just talk about it. And that's been one of the biggest things that we've done. And again, we're up about three X year over year. Uh, so uh, what we're doing, it, 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 is, uh, it is starting to click, but we, uh, we've definitely been um, most successful when we can demonstrate the product itself. So David, maybe one other question that would be good um, for the group is what do you see the future of our market, our business in the broader AI space? Yeah, so when I think about where AI is heading, I think about the convergence of a bunch of trends. Uh, so I, I showed a bunch of demos here connecting different systems today. I couldn't have done that demo 10 years ago when all of our systems were running on premise and there weren't these open APIs to go connect to. So the APIification of our systems, putting all these systems in the cloud is a requisite ingredient for making this AI stuff work. Uh, I think we'll continue to see that happen and you'll see the long tail of apps that have, have resisted the cloud uh, start to finally move over. I think the next thing that we'll, we're, we're gonna see is that uh, expectations will continue to go up. Like 
I, I don't want to shop at a website that doesn't have a bot. I'm 37. Uh, I have a half sister who's uh, going to be turned 17 this year. She, like if she can't chat somewhere, like forget it. So you'll see as each generation continues, you, you'll start to see more and more adoption of this kind of technology. Uh, the next thing that you're going to see is that uh, as uh, the adoption goes up, our expectations won't stay the same. They'll actually go up again, meaning that we'll expect to not only just ask questions and get answers, but we'll expect to be able to uh, really have the context of the user understood in these conversations. And then finally, uh, I think that we're, we will get to a point where from an employee standpoint, from a team member standpoint, people will start to choose where they work based on the tech stack that they run. So in the same way that uh, I've been on Mac for a long time, it'd be hard for me to go back to a Windows environment. Sorry, I know there are a lot of Windows people on this call. Uh, very similarly, you'll see people who, or maybe maybe another example, people are like, oh, we're, not, we're big fans of SAP, but we didn't like Oracle or vice versa. You will actually see people start to gravitate toward companies that have AI stacks that empower them to get their, get their best work done. Our mission at Capacity is to help teams do their best work. That's why we started this company. And we, we fundamentally believe in our ability uh, to bring this into, into the market. And we're seeing it. Nothing, nothing more exciting than seeing a customer come back to us and say, we've cut costs, increased SAT, and uh, we're doing it with a uh, seamless deployment. Any last, we got two minutes left. Any last questions? All right. It does appear that we're at the top of our hour and we do thank you, David and Daniel for your very great presentation today. For those of you who are earning CPE credits, please be aware that it will, does take between seven and 10 business days. If you're still on the platform and you would like to earn CPE credits, feel free to answer this last poll. And I'll give you just a few seconds for that. In just a moment, I'm gonna turn this over to Roseanne, who's going to welcome our group into a, uh, a, a nice networking session. And uh, enjoy, folks. All right, thank you, Nancy. Thank you everyone for being here today, appreciate that. I do invite you all to stick around for a networking portion um, of this event. It's gonna take just a, a few minutes. So we'll, we'll let some folks drop off and then we're gonna uh, invite everybody to turn their cameras on and say hello to your uh, fellow webinar folks.